recently I've received quite a few emails and comments from people suggesting that I take a look at the new Inov C3 camera. Of course, it's the follow-up to the C1 and C2 that I reviewed back in January 2014. I found those cameras to be very capable little micro cameras. It can record in 1080p30 and 720p60. They both come in this nice metal body design. The only difference between the two is that the C2 has a wider angle lens, but they both have this very handy little slider switch, which lets the user select between looping, recycling mode, so the card is overwritten when it's full. You can use it as a dash cam that way, or normal recording mode. Now, it's slightly amusing people have been pointing out to me that the C3 is out, because in a way, I've had a bit of a hand in its design, I suppose. Before I did the C1 and C2 reviews, December 13, I was already feeding information to Rock over at Inov about my ideas for a follow-up camera. Now, the reason I'm feeding back ideas is because people feed them to me in comments and suggestions and things, so I've compiled some of those together, sent them on to Rock, and gave him a few ideas about what he might want to think about putting in a follow-up camera. And believe it or not, he's actually listened to me, or I suppose that's you in that regard, and he's incorporated some of those ideas into the C3 camera. Now, this is a bit of a niche camera. It's not the kind of thing that everyone will want, uh, uh, tiny little camera like the C1 or C2 will be suitable for probably more people than this but for somebody that's looking for a camera that looks like this then this might just suit their requirements. I'll explain a little bit more. You see the unit itself looks very similar to the old C1 and C2. We've got the same buttons on there, the same LED, the same non-standard USB port on the back, a micro SD card slot in there, switch on the side but on the front just got a light and well what looks like an hdmi port no lens on there the lens is actually a separate unit comes on a wire here it is inside the box as you can see that's the front of it there i'll pull it all out and show you what i've got in here now because rock sent this one to me specially he sent me two different camera units the front bit with the lens on um, so that one there and then there's this one here now if you were buying this yourself you're just going to get one of these that's the 120 degree version there and that's the 90 degree field of view version there so I can do a bit of a comparison during the course of the video show you what the difference is now they do come with like an HDMI lead on the front but that's just for connection purposes you can't just plug that into your television or do anything like that it's just because it's a good sensible lead to use now here's some of the things that you get inside the box. Not everything's there. I'll show you everything though, but I couldn't fit it really all on the table at the same time. First off, let's look at the mounts. Now the mount for the recording unit, I'm going to call it, rather than the camera, can go in this little clip here. Now that is useful for, uh, you can attach it to a tripod if you unscrew that clip, but I kept the clip on mine because I found it handy to put the camera, sorry, recording unit in there and clip it onto the outside pocket of my motorcycle jacket when I took this camera out on the bike. That's it clipped there, you can see in the front. Of course, it's not a waterproof unit, so if it was raining, you'd want to put that in an inside pocket. Now, this part here is a little clip, looks a little bit like a microphone holder. Uh, that's what the camera plonks into, and you can see you can rotate that into positions. There's a sticky back bit on the back and there's room for a belt to go through that as well if you wanted to. Now I put that on the side of my motorcycle helmet like that and clip the camera onto the side of it. A nice discreet solution. It's got a little notch on the top there so you can see where the top of the camera is or you can feel it as well. And you just clip it in there like that as you can see. One thing about these very firm, these mounts, the cameras won't rotate once in them and it's pretty hard to get them in and out sometimes. I was a bit afraid of snapping the things, but they all seem to work fine. Now that is a bicycle handlebar mount there. Now I don't have a bicycle, but I've got a motorcycle. So what I did with that one, as you can see, by the way, it can be rotated as well. I held it that way around on my bike and put it round the uh, wing mirrors. Are they wing mirrors on bikes? Anyway, you know what I mean, the mirrors. Now you can take that out of there and clip it like that if you want and leave that bit on your bicycle so you can take the camera unit with you and someone's not going to nick it when your bike's parked up somewhere. And then finally we've got this little unit here uh, which you can screw into the camera and again mount that to various things if you wish. So there's a few different options there. That part there is perhaps the most useful thing in the box though. It enables the camera to attach to anything that has a standard tripod screw on it so you don't want to lose that. It's very useful. Now this is one thing I didn't show you in that picture before a head mount for the camera so you can put it around the back of your head put the camera in there and i think this is the kind of thing that maybe someone working the door you know security a bouncer that kind of person could use 
if they're allowed to, not entirely sure legally. Right, wires. This is the charging and data transfer lead. As you can see, it's a non-standard micro USB plug on there. And then this one is a longer one. It's just for power, not data transfer. You'd use that in your car if you wanted to use this camera as a dash cam. And then this little thing here is what you plug that into. That's one of those 12 volt to 5 volt USB power adapters. Or you could use your own if you've got one already. But it's nice that they've included it. And then finally this wire is terminated in a microphone at one end with a little clip on it. And the other end of that is terminated in that same non-standard micro USB plug. Now the camera does have a built-in microphone, but you'd use this external one if you wanted to put a microphone inside, say, a motorcycle helmet and use the camera for moto vlogging. And the final lead inside the box is this standard definition AV out lead. The wire that attaches the camera unit to the lens unit is quite thick. After all, it's pretty much an HDMI lead. It's flexible though, you can bend it around, but it is quite a chunky lead. And that's to avoid data loss and sparklers and interference and things on the video. Let's break things up a little bit. I'm going to show you some clips that I recorded with the camera. Usual disclaimer applies that sometimes YouTube can negatively affect the quality of the clip, so don't believe exactly what you see. If you want to see the true quality, download some clips that I'll have available on my blog. Now the first few shots that you'll see are all based around using the camera on my motorcycle, which is the kind of thing you might want to do with a camera like this. On these ones here, I was trying to do some moto vlogging. I've got the 90 degree camera attached to the left hand side of my helmet there, just to the uh, back of the visor. As you can see, there isn't too much of the helmet in shot on the right because I'm using the 90 degree lens. It doesn't uh, include too much of that kind of side of the image. If I use a 120 degree one, I think I'd just get more motorcycle helmet in shot and not much else. 90 degrees is fine for this. Now just have a look what comes up now. There you go, that was a jump in the video. Now the reason there was a jump there, I've chosen to record in one minute segments. So every minute there'll be a new segment created. And when you join those together, there's a little bit of a jump. And what happens is it jumps back in time about half a second. So every time you get a new clip, you see about half a second of the video from the previous one again. Bit of an annoyance that. It's one of the things that happens with a lot of these cameras. It's just the way they work and the way they create a new file. You can, of course, edit that out. Another way to mitigate it is to have longer files and you can change the file length in the settings to three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, those kind of things. This shot here, I've got the camera mounted on my left hand mirror stalk. This is a 120 degree camera. And as you can see, because I've got it on the left hand side there, there's just a little bit of the motorbike in shot on the right, but it's actually quite a nice shot. I've got it at a bit of a weird angle and I think that's because I put it on when I was sat on the bike and it was at a bit of an angle and when I straightened it up it didn't uh, straighten up properly. That's the trouble when you put a camera on your bike when it's on its stand. I was trying a few different things with the microphone. That first one I had the microphone plugged in. I was trying to speak into the mic when I had it in my helmet. It just got a lot of wind noise on it. I think that's mostly down to my helmet but it could be the mic. I don't really know. This one here, I had the camera behind the uh, bit on the bike which stops the wind coming up where all the dials and clocks are and things. So it doesn't get too much wind into the camera, but you can't really hear much else. You can't really hear any engine sound. Now on the next clip, we're going back to the 90 degree camera again that I've got mounted on the helmet. This time though, I've got the little uh, unit, the recorder unit, clipped on my top breast pocket. So basically the wind is just hitting that now. Uh, so this really does get a lot of wind noise on it. So that's probably not a good idea. Of course the microphone is inside that little unit. So it's just getting wind sound hitting it. Uh, so you're going to choose using that or using that extended microphone. I suppose at least you've got a choice. I'll show you a 720p60 file here. So this is recorded again with the helmet cam 90 degrees but I've switched into 720p 60 mode just to show you what that looks like of course you're looking at it on YouTube this is going to be in 30 frames a second because the whole video is in 30 frames a second because it's pr primarily 1080p 30 video with just this little bit in it but I'll have this clip available as well you can download that and then you can watch it in the proper 60 frames per second mode but overall I think you'll agree quality of these images is great for this little camera that's very discreet you can mount it on the side of your helmet and you don't look like a complete idiot when you're using it at least I don't think I did nobody was pointing anyway now this shot here I've put the camera in the back of the car 
but as you can see just facing backwards another idea people might want to use this camera as a rear view camera not not for using for reversing and things but as an accident camera car dvr a dash cam although of course it's not a dash it's at the other end of the car you can see the kind of quality that you can get out of that and again you can plug it in your lighter socket it automatically starts when the car starts up it stops when the car stops it loops around and you can just leave it plugged in all year round if you want works perfectly fine as a dash cam notice i've turned the timestamp off on that clip as i have on this clip as well i'm going to show you some stuff around town now uh, going into the print work to demonstrate what the camera or how the camera functions in lower light environments the print works is quite dark inside it's so that all the neon looks excited that's why they keep the light low so it's a good place for me to test out a camera like this now this is a 90 degree camera that i'm using the light performance, the low light performance on both cameras, both lenses is identical. You don't notice any difference, but I'm just showing you what this looks like. It looks pretty good, really. It does a good uh, performance in there, nice and sharp. You can see all the brickwork opposite. Now, this is what the other lens, 120 degree lens, looks like. Notice you've got more fisheye, more barrel distortion. Of course, I've twisted it around a bit. To show you the difference, that's a 90 degree there, and that's 120 degree. Just to give you a bit of an idea what difference you can see try that again inside the uh, Arndale shopping centre here so this is 1080p 30 with the 90 degree lens and that's the 120 degree lens there in 1080p 30 and you can see you can see quite a bit more there now if we move across again into the 720p 60 mode that's what that looks like there isn't too much difference it's a bit fizzy sometimes the 720p mode but it's a perfectly decent 720p image and that's the 120 degree lens there so you've got a bit of an idea now, once the camera can take stills, I can't really imagine anyone using it for that, but this is what one of them looks like. This is a 4-3 ratio, 3 megapixel still taken with the 90 degree lens. And then this is a 4-3 ratio, 3 megapixel still taken with the 120 degree lens. But enough of that, let's have a listen to the sound quality. I got no plans to make, no promise to keep. I'm dabbled and drowsy and ready for sleep till the morning to drop on it. Now this was recorded using the built-in microphone which is hidden behind uh, the metal case. There's no hole in the case to let the sound through but it still seems to work remarkably well. Now the camera doesn't have any kind of built-in image stabilisation normally it wouldn't matter because a camera like this you tend to put on a helmet and your head tends to dampen down the vibrations and movement i'm walking around with the camera being held in my hand here and you can see the kind of effect i get it's not terrible at all by any stretch of the imagination it's always good having a wide angle lens because it tends to mitigate or reduce the effects of vibration a little bit compared to a very narrow lens now not everything works out as well uh, i tried the head mount and these are the results i apologize for the unkempt sideburns i have since rectified that issue but the camera i'm using is the 120 degree lens version so there's perhaps a bit too much of my head in shot but the way you mount the camera to the side of your head i think you're always going to get some of that in the image I did mention earlier on that perhaps this might be useful for somebody working at a, a club or something on the door but I think it's probably going to cause you more trouble than it's worth, to be honest. But you might find a use for this, and it's nice that they've put the appropriate head mount inside the box. Right, let's try something a little bit less Isaac Asimov, and I want to show you what the footage looks like at night time. So I've put it in my car and gone round this little block again. I've also done a bit of a voiceover to the camera unit, so let's just have a listen to the sound quality that comes across. If you do get the C3 to use it as a concealed dash cam a couple of things to think about um, the first one is you'll need to figure out how to put the camera unit in your window somewhere um, I just suction cut this one to the middle I did it in the dark it might be a bit of an angle I sort of just rushed this so um, I'm just showing you the uh, quality of the image rather than a perfect mounting of the camera uh, but one thing I can see already, even though I've just quickly put it on my windscreen, it's hardly taking up any room at all. It's not getting in the way of my line of sight. Uh, the other thing to think about is the control unit, the bit with the buttons on it. Uh, you're going to be hiding that away somewhere, presumably. And of course, it's got to be within reach of the power supply in your car. 
and that's the part of the camera unit that has the microphone in it so you might find that if you shove that away somewhere in a glove box or something you're not going to be picking up uh, much sound on your dash cam now i've mentioned before that audio in dash cams is perhaps a bit overrated it's not as important as people make out but i thought it's worth mentioning that point all the same as far as the quality goes it's not the best i've ever seen in uh, night time in a dash cam one thing it doesn't do it doesn't add grain it tends to show what it can see it doesn't artificially increase the brightness and it does a reasonable respectable job but it's not amazing Right, let's have a look at the operation of the camera. So the first thing that you've got to choose is how you want the camera to record. Do you want it to loop over the memory card when it's full so that it can be used as a dash cam, or do you want it to just record up until the card is full and then it can't record anymore? So you choose that on this three position switch. The rear position is the normal mode and the middle one is a looping one. The forward position turns on that white LED on the front of the unit. So once you pick that, you need to turn the camera on. Hold down the bottom button for three seconds. The red light comes on and then immediately starts flashing. That means it's recording. When it's flashing, it's recording. These are the settings that you get straight out of the box. You can change these later on if you want, if you don't want it to automatically start recording when you switch it on, but these are the default settings. Now there's no indicator on the lens unit itself that the camera's recording. The only thing that you can see is this flashing light on this recording unit. So to stop it recording, press the top button, the red light goes on permanently, which means that it's in standby mode. Now you can change modes. 1080p 30 is red, 720p 60 is green, the stills mode is yellow, and then the final mode is this motion activation mode where you get the flashing light. I'll show you that in a second. And then press it again back to 1080p 30. So it goes around in a loop like that. You've got the four modes. If you want to start recording, just tap the top button, the red light starts flashing, that means it's recording. And it'd be the same if you wanted to record in 720p 60. If you want to take a still, you just tap the top button and every time it uh, flashes, it's taking another still. Now this motion activation mode's a bit unusual. The idea is you can leave the camera sat in your car waiting to receive a jolt and then it'll start recording. When it's flashing quickly, it's in standby waiting for a jolt. And then if I give it a shake now, you'll see it starts flashing slower and that means it's recording. So it records when it's flashing slowly for a full minute and then it just goes back to waiting to receive another jolt. The idea is I suppose you could leave it in your car if somebody was to bump into it in the right area where the camera's pointing at hopefully you get some kind of evidence. Now if you find that that mode gets in the way you can change it in the settings later on by turning off the G sensor and then that mode disappears so you just get the 1080p 30 720p 60 and the photo mode anyway to turn it off hold down the button at the bottom and the camera switches off so at its most basic setting if you don't want to go around messing with the different modes all a novice would have to do is hold down the bottom button to switch it on the camera turns on automatically starts recording 1080p 30 video and then when they want to stop recording, they can hold down that bottom button and the camera will switch off. So therefore you can have the camera as simple as that, or you can go into the menu options I'll show you later on and change all sorts of things. Now if you want to use this camera as a dash cam, it's very simple. Just put that switch into that middle position for the recycling mode. Using the supplied power lead, one end goes into the camera, the other end into that 5 volt USB adapter into your car 12 volt power supply when the car is switched on the power comes through it automatically turns the camera on as you can see and it automatically starts recording like it did before and then when you eventually turn off your car engine the power gets disconnected from this lead and the camera will stop recording and shut down so I've pulled the lead to simulate the power being turned off at the other end you can see the camera is still recording at the moment. It does for a few seconds afterwards, but eventually the red light goes solid as it has done now and the camera shuts down. So it does make for a good little dash cam. Now you can just use the camera like that. It's no need to change any of these settings, but I'll show you how to do it if you want to. Go on the Inov website, download the appropriate piece of software. It's for Windows only at the moment. Then you can attach your camera to your computer using that supplied USB 
data transfer lead or if you want you can just get the SD card take that out of the camera and plug that into your PC now once you get the software up and running you get this configuration page I'll talk you through most of the options on here a lot of them are self-explanatory top left there you can see we've got the time and date that's how you set the time and date inside the camera below there disable or enable the date stamp you'll have seen some of the clips I showed you earlier on had the date stamp enabled and some it was missing that's where you change that option below there recording indicator disable or enable that's the flashing light on the camera when it records and below there we've got the power on record I mentioned that before when you turn the camera on it'll automatically start recording unless you disable that and then it's down to you to press the record button when you want it to start recording the video sound that's whether or not it records audio motion detection isn't the one I mentioned earlier on that's one where if you leave the camera and it sees motion it'll start recording I haven't really experimented with that I'm never too enamored with that feature frequency is to adjust for the lights flickering that you're recording in your country TV mode again for your television standard at the top middle it's my video that's where you put on your own stamp you'll see some of my clips said techmone on there that's where i type that in it has to be all in capitals a couple of options below there rather obvious the photo size and the saturation the continue shot is how many stills it will take in one go below there a n b i think that might supposed to be a w b which would be the white balance uh, you can leave it in auto day or night i've just left it in auto time lapse video that's an interesting option you can have the camera in the video modes take a uh, frame every five seconds 15 seconds 30 seconds or a minute and that will affect all the video modes so once you switch that on then the camera will just work like a time-lapse camera but record a video file made up of those frames how to explain i suppose really i'll show you an example later on it might be more obvious uh, video clip length i set mine to one minute but you've got a choice of three minutes five minutes ten minutes or 30 minutes in there and then you've got the exposure value at the bottom top right a default video that's what it is when you switch it on the first one whether you want it in the 1080p 30 mode or the 720p 60 mode and then the g sensor sensitivity high medium low that's the shock sensor if you switch it off that's uh, mode at the end that one with the flashing lights doesn't appear and there's also another reason to shut that off I'll show you later on and then the power off delay setting that's how long the camera sits around before it switches itself off if nothing's happening and then the shooting delay is how long it waits before it starts recording after you've pressed the record button I tend to leave that off so it just starts immediately and then what you do with that once you've changed everything exactly how you want you press the bottom one which says create configuration file then you press the middle one which says save to camera and that creates a file called cfconfig.bin now if you have a look inside that file you can see that it's just a list of the options that you've chosen in text form but what happens is once that file is on the sd card and you put the sd card back inside the camera or if you've attached it up to your computer using a usb lead you unplug the usb lead and then switch on the camera what happens is those changes get updated to the camera so you can see i've turned it on and what happens now is rather than just coming straight on there's a bit of a delay and then you get this light flashing very quickly that means those changes are being written to the camera and then once it's done the light goes out and it deletes that file off the sd card so the next time you come to turn on the camera the camera is operating with those new settings now if you're a mac user don't be sad because there is a way to get around this even though the programs for the PC only of course that config file is just a text file so you can manually edit that in a text editor and then save it to your SD card and upload it to the camera in the same way now I know from experience that there'll be loads of people out there that just want to get this camera out of the box and start using it immediately without messing around with any of those settings there was a bit of a problem with this though and that is that the timestamp shipped as a default switched on and that meant that you'd have to adjust the time for your country which meant that you'd have to go into those settings and there's another issue as well most people i would imagine don't actually want the timestamp on their videos it's only if someone was using it as a dash cam personally i tend to switch it off on mine because i don't like having a timestamp at the bottom so i had a thought about this i i emailed rock over at enov and suggested to him that maybe he should ship the cameras with the timestamp turned off as a default 
And then if people want it, they can switch it on later on. He thought that was a good idea. So hopefully now if you buy a camera, it will ship as a default with no timestamp. I thought I should show you what that time-lapse mode looks like. So I've chosen the bottom option on the menus here, which says five seconds. I think what it's doing is it's recording five frames a second rather than the usual 30. At least I think that's what's happening. But what happens is the camera creates a video file that looks like this. Now that's unlike some of the other time-lapse modes I've seen in other cameras that just record a load of stills and it's up to you to stitch them together. This camera creates a video file that's a sort of time-lapse video file. Very nice feature. It would enable you to drive all the way across a country and fit the whole journey onto one SD card. While I'm showing you stuff, let me show you what it looks like when you plug this camera into a television using the supplied leads. As you can see, I've pressed record, the camera's recording, you can see the flashing light on it, and also there's an indicator on the top of the TV screen. So I've got a live feed of what's happening whilst the camera's recording, which is interesting to people that use these cameras in remote control aircraft. I can also change modes into 720p mode or into the photo mode, and of course take stills or video in either mode. Press it once more though, and we get into the playback mode where I can play back videos that I've recorded earlier on. You get sound and movement, of course, but it's, it's pretty ropey quality because it's just coming out over those little uh, leads. You really want to play back your video properly in a computer or something. So to sum up for the heart of understanding, yes, you can record and output live video all at the same time. Now let's have a look at some stats. The maximum size of a micro SD card you can put into one of these is 32 gigs. I suggest you use a class six or above decent quality card as well, of course. 1080p 30 video. On my tests, I was getting 15.65 megabits a second bit rate. It's a variable bit rate, so we'll go up and down. 720p 60 again, variable bit rate, 14.01 megabits a second. Three minutes of 1080p 30 video therefore takes up approximately 370 megs. Nine minutes per gigabyte on my calculations. 32 gigs, that means you could probably fit 4.8 hours or so on a 32 gig card of 1080p video. The weight of the camera, including the lens unit, the recording box and the cable is 127 grams or 4.4 ounces. The camera cable itself, the one that attaches the lens to the recording unit, one and a half meters or five foot, that's on the one I got anyway. And the car power cable, the one for using it as a dash cam, four meters long, which is 13 foot and finally battery life it's 80 minutes the reason i've got it like that people always tend to miss it in my videos so look mcfly there it is 80 minutes of battery life got it okay no need to rely on it though because you can plug in a usb battery pack into the back of the camera using this applied lead any old usb battery pack will do and something like this will give you all day power perhaps even longer shove that in your inside pocket you can be out on your motorcycle and record for hours on end. But of course you can't use the microphone and power the camera from a battery at the same time because it uses the same port. Now one thing I didn't mention earlier on, the body of the camera unit, the lens unit, is metal. It's quite a heavy thing really. I mean you don't feel it on a motorcycle helmet, but I wouldn't want to swing it around by the cable because you'd probably damage it. So you've got to take a bit of care with this. It's also water resistant rather than waterproof and you can unscrew it in the middle here where there's a bit of a rubber grommet. So don't be daft and try and go scuba diving or something with it. It's just for resisting rain. One thing about it, once you get it in one of these mounts, very hard to rotate it. So if you don't get it straight to start with, you have a lot of trouble trying to get it straight. It's easy just to take it out and try it again. Okay, now what's wrong with this shot? Now hopefully you can figure it out. I haven't got a levitating car. What's actually happening is the video's the wrong way up, obviously, but look, the timestamp is the right way up at the bottom. It took me a while to figure out exactly what happened to create this shot. I figured it out in the end. There's an orientation sensor inside the recording unit, not inside the lens. So what happens is you can get the lens perfectly uh, located in your car exactly how you want it but if the recording unit's upside down then the video will be the wrong way up as well so i just shoved this down inside my car somewhere and it recorded upside down video what you need to do is turn off the g sensor in the settings and it doesn't matter which way up you have the recording unit the video will always follow the way up that the lens is at the beginning of this video i mentioned that this was a niche camera although that being said it seems to be a niche camera that will fit into quite a few niches 
seemed to work really well as a helmet camera. I didn't have too much luck with it as a head camera, but you can see how it could potentially be used as that. Discrete car camera, whether you want a hidden camera front or rear, it seems to work well as that. And you could also perhaps touch and cut one to the side of a car that was doing a track day to get some really interesting shots. Some people might want to attach one of these to a gun. I mean, there's loads of things that you could do with a camera like this, but if you can't think of anything that you could use this particular camera for, Maybe you'd be better off with something a little bit more traditional. And if you pick up perhaps an Inov C1 or a C2, I think they share a lot of the features of this particular model. Now, if you want to buy an Inov C3, you can click the links in the video description or go over to techmoan.com. On there, you'll find downloadable samples that you can try out for yourself, but also you'll find a discount code that's been supplied to me by Inov. And if you use that on their website, I believe you get a $5 discount off the purchase price. Now, I just want to be clear, I'm not earning any commission here. I think all that's happening is that Inov want to know where the interest has come from so that they know where it's worth sending any future review samples of their products to. Anyway, that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.